Welcome to Under One Roof's Landlord and Letting Agent webinar series, made possible through the generous funding of the Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust. The webinar will start momentarily. For those who are joining us for the first time, Under One Roof is a free independent service that supports landlords, letting agents, owner-occupiers, factors, local authority housing officers, and others throughout the sector with issues around owning and maintaining a tenement flat in Scotland. Last year, through funding from Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust, Scottish Government, and local authorities throughout Scotland, we attained charity status, which has enabled us to hire full-time staff dedicated to working with landlords and owner-occupiers of tenement flats and those that support them. In the coming months and years, Under One Roof will be increasing the information available on our website, our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts, and through our monthly newsletter. We encourage you to share information we send out with those in your building or in your sector to help us improve the quality of tenement flats in Scotland. Today's webinar will last one hour. We encourage you to post your questions and comments into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. When asking a question, please provide your name and a brief description of the issue you'd like to raise. If you'd like to appear on screen and ask your question directly, rather than just have us read it out, please let us know. If we run out of time before your question is answered, please drop us an email with your question. The information provided in this webinar is designated to help you understand your rights and responsibilities and to understand what professionals tell you. Any technical information on repairs is designed to help you spot problems with your building and then understand quotations from builders so you can get the best job carried out for the best price. But every building and every group of owners is unique, and so are their problems, which is why the information presented in this webinar can only act as a general guidance. It is not advice or a recommended course of action. When it comes to action, you should always seek professional help with anything more than a simple problem. More details and our legal disclaimer can be found in the About Us section of our website. Finally, if you are a housing professional wishing to record your attendance as CPD, Please visit the webinar page on our website so you can log your participation and receive a confirmation certificate. We'll also post a link to the CPD page in the comments sections during the webinar. Thanks for joining us. Let's begin. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar on cladding, which is one of our series for landlords and letting agents and thankfully funded by Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust. Um, I know there are going to be some well-kent names in the attendance list. I'm really pleased to see all of you back again. Um, and we've also got a guest who you may have spoken to or heard before in the terms of David Reed from the Property Factors, uh, sorry, Property Managers Association of Scotland. In the video itself, we've got Stephen Garvin, who is from Scottish Government. Um, he has been one of these people, you know, one of the team that's been heading up the ministerial working group on cladding, and he'll explain what that's about and what they've been trying to achieve on behalf of, of owners. Um, we're then going to have David Reed. Um, David Reed uh, was on the ministerial working group in his role as the president of the Property Managers Association of Scotland. He's now stepped down from that. He's taking a wee bit of break, except he's here for us today. And we've also got Chris Ashurst. Now, Chris formed the High Rise Owners sorry, High Rise Action Group Scotland. Chris is going to tell me off about this. The High Rise Scotland Action Group, which is there for owners, and he's an owner himself. So um, I think you're going to get a lot of empathy from Chris. So the videos are going to take about 33, 35 minutes. Um, if you do need to pop out for that comfort break that we aren't going to put in, then um, these, these webinars are going to be recorded and you'll be able to have a look at the recording. So, Mike, with no more ado, would you just like to tee up those videos and let's get going and we'll see you on the other side for a live Q&A with David Reed and Chris Ashurst. Thank you for tuning in to Under One Roof's Private Landlord webinar series. The first interview you'll be watching is with Stephen Garvin, Head of Building Standards at the Scottish Government, where we'll be discussing the issue of cladding in Scotland. So, Stephen, can you first tell us a little bit about the single building assessment and how it came about? Yes, so if we go back just over four years ago now to the Grenfell Tower fire, uh, Scottish Government, uh, like governments around the UK, has done a lot of work uh, around fire safety and high-rise developments, including introducing new fire safety standards and guidance around the, the cladding on the outside of buildings now over 11 metres. However, uh, just around about two years ago now, we began to 
experience uh, an increase in correspondence from individual flat owners and property managers uh, concerning uh, problems with uh, selling and lending on uh, flats and typically in high-rise developments. So in looking into this, it was decided to set up a ministerial working group with the key stakeholders in the sector. So the lenders, insurers, property managers, uh, and indeed representatives of the those affected directly, the homeowners uh, uh, within high rises. Of course, it, it began to affect more than just properties over 18 metres, which we typically consider as a, a high rise. And clearly the situation was becoming uh, more serious as it, as it was going along. So the, the uh, Ministerial Working Group was set up by the then Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, Kevin Stewart. And it met uh, over the period up to March this year when it reported. And one of the key recommendations of the Ministerial Working Group was to set up what was called the Single Building Assessment. Uh, subsequently, as the Ministers accepted all the recommendations of the Ministerial Working Group. And single building assessment uh, is essentially, I like to think of it as having three bits to it. The first bit is a generic fire risk assessment. So these are sort of things that should be done as a, as a matter of good practice within flatted property, particularly high rise property in any case. And it considers the common areas, uh, traditionally, though, it hasn't considered the external walls of buildings. So we've also, within the single building assessment, have a external wall appraisal, as we call it, an EWA. And that is really taking a close look at the external wall, cladding systems, and other factors of that wall that could uh, increase or indeed decrease the, the safety risk. Uh, the third piece of the single building assessment is an external wall appraisal form. And that is a, a, a kind of summarised way of communicating risk to uh, relevant stakeholders, whether it's lenders, uh, property managed property owners. Uh, and we have a simple uh, mechanism, which is uh, simply a high risk, low risk uh, uh, box to, to be ticked at the end of the end of the exercise but to get to that point it needs a thorough assessment so we need the right people uh, the properly trained and experienced uh, to be involved in this so fire engineers chartered fire engineers uh, but also uh, surveyors who have appropriate experience can be part of this as well and indeed pot potentially other professions. And can you talk about uh, a little bit about the um, where the program right is right now? So I understand that it's in a pilot project phase right sure. now. Um, 25 buildings that we're taking forward uh, currently into a pilot process. Uh, so the, the, the way in which that's working is that uh, we're obviously communicating with those uh, groups of owners, property managers, factors, etc., on a uh, regular basis, trying to help them. Uh, government's role is to provide the basis of the single building assessment to set the expectation, the standard, uh, and but the delivery will be through the owners engaging with the right professionals. So the, uh, we're looking for owners then to complete a further application form, giving us the detail of who they're engaging with, clearly the costs, et cetera, and uh, we can then get that rolling out. Uh, so the, I suppose it, in this particular phase though, Mike, it's important to remember that there's already been quite a lot of pre-existing work out there. So people have been on site, they've been looking at things, uh, so we're not all starting from the same uh, point in time or part of the process. 
uh, and the phase we're in at the moment is really about uh, learning, making improvements to the processes that we, that we have, to the guidance that we uh, that we have uh, for those applying for the single building assessment, and indeed those undertaking them uh, on on behalf of owners, etc. So uh, we're, we're looking to move that on as quickly as possible. Uh, but we are learning a lot as we're going along. So, and when um, the results of the pilot project come back, as you said, it's sort of a so, sort of a learning as you go mm -hmm. exercise. So, obviously, there'll be some uh, lessons that are learned from the first process that'll then mean for a change for when this is hopefully rolled out to the wider public. You're right to highlight the role of the uh, project board, which is is very important. And we meet with the board on a monthly basis, and we'll be reporting back progress at each point. So, you know, we uh, the, the the board itself is, has got, I suppose, a number of functions to be advisory, to provide sharing of information as to perhaps what's affecting parts of the sector, uh, whether it's lending, insurance, property management, etc. I think looking further forward from that, it's, it's difficult to put exact dates against things, but uh, what we know is with 25 buildings, they will run at different uh, speeds, if you like, uh, and, and some are, some buildings, uh, as, as I said earlier, a bit more ad advanced in the pre-existing information that they have, and we'll be able to move on and complete the process, if you like, quicker. We want to move on to the uh, full phase rollout as soon as possible, um, and I think was difficult to put exact time scale on that we'll certainly see that coming along in the next few months and finally Stephen just briefly could you um what is the ultimate outcome that that the sort of everyone is looking uh okay. to come out of this whole process um key issue is to deal with the safety of the buildings and where it's demonstrated through the single building assessment that there is a a safety issue it, we need to lead on to remediation. And uh, that uh, is clearly a, a further step on. I think a successful remediation should uh, alleviate uh, many of the problems that are out there. And that's why we, within the board, uh, retain this, this sort of cross uh, industry sectors um, interest because we, uh, whilst uh, different groups have different views of things and, and different drivers, it's important that we uh, are making sure that what, uh, what's done through single building assessment and ultimately any cladding remediation that's required uh, is is going to work for uh, for the owners in the long term. I I think is is as well the the uh, single building assessment. I suppose we, uh, we're we opening it up quite widely, so it's not just 18 metres plus buildings or 11 metres plus. Could be lower rise as well, although we don't expect there's going to be a, a great demand or need that with the lower buildings. If we can uh, demonstrate through this, not we, but, but if the single building assessment can demonstrate that buildings are safe, then we would expect that to, to have substantial benefit with regard to the lending, insurance issues, etc. Uh, but where remediation is, is needed, then uh, certainly that is something that, that we need to go on to consider. Yeah. In our next interview, we'll be speaking to David Reid on the effects that the cladding issue has in Scotland for factors in particular. David Reid is the immediate past president of the Property Managers Association in Scotland and is a member of the Ministerial Working Group on Mortgage Lending and Cladding. Why don't we first start off uh, with uh, you talking about how the issue of cladding affects flat owners in Scotland? Yeah, the, the, the whole situation is, is, is a very sorry one. To, to be fair, you, you find yourself in a situation or the homeowners find themselves in a situation where they're sitting in blocks of flats where potentially there is uh, elements of construction and design that are unsafe, um, which doesn't allow them to put their head in a pillow at, at night and feel safe. And the knowledge that the building is safe and, and free from 
free from any potential fire risk um, within it. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit about the, the difficulties uh, when it comes to trying to buy, sell, or remortgage flatted residential properties uh, in buildings with external wall cladding? Yeah, not, not long after Grenfell, um, well, not long after the Hackett report was, was issued in December 18, I think it was, um, or 19, uh, where there was a statement in there that the uh, cladding that was on Grenville was not the cladding that had been submitted to planning. We've seen a, a, a very quick change from lenders and surveyors in regard to um, remortgaging and lending for homeowners. So we immediately started to get a number of homeowners contacting us and, and, and telling us that this challenge existed. The issue of cladding, is how is it different for those flats uh, in Scotland as opposed to the freeholders in England? I mean, what is the specifically around Scotland that makes it sort of challenging? In Scotland, it is the collective homeowners. And the best description I can give is, uh, certainly for our own organisation, is a, a block of flats in Edinburgh, which is about 400, um, in order to be able to get a, a survey, fire safety audit survey carried out. Um, there's another unintended consequence of an Act of Parliament, which is the Property Factors Act 2011, which clearly states that we need to consult with all homeowners before we carry out additional works out with our core services. Um, core services being insurance, cleaning, ground maintenance, fire maintenance, etc. Um, to get a survey done, we have to go into a consultation process. And when you have a block like the one that I've just described, where there's apathy, um, and they're pulling homeowners together to achieve a majority to agree to additional works is extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, you were uh, now you were a member of the ministerial working group on mortgage lending and cladding here in, uh, for the Scottish government. Um, talk a little bit about um, what that group did, and um, as far as talking through the issues um, and what conclusions they came to, uh, they came to. Uh, so, so, so the work that we, we, we commenced was to, to, to ultimately um, discuss all the topics, discuss all the challenges, put forward suggestions, um, uh, and, and the end result after about 18 months of, of work in various different meetings, numerous different meetings, was the, the um, single building assessment um, application registration system uh, arrived, um, a real positive because there was some lessons learned from the process uh, down, down in England um, uh, in terms of how you could apply for funding uh, to get remedial work carried out in your building. Stages of this was that the, the, the single building application process would, would be initially to carry out a pilot. Uh, these, this pilot stage included 25 developments that the uh, Scottish Government have narrowed down from, from all the applications that were submitted. Uh, they will then assess the application process. As I said, I've actually entered into it with four of our organisations' developments to, to, to make sure I have a clear understanding of how that process will work for our, our homeowners. The starting point is you had to have a survey already completed. So for any homeowners or any developments that haven't managed to have a survey carried out um, or haven't managed to, to engage with whether it's a property manager or whether it's collectively the homeowners, then it's an absolute priority to make sure that some form of survey is achieved. Um, if not, then you will be further down the staged process that the Scottish Government have available at the moment. What will now happen if it was to take one of our developments is we will seek project manage, a project manager who will manage the application, review the survey that we've already had carried out for the development. That property manager will then complete the Scottish Government application on our behalf, um, identifying the costs of a, a full fire safety audit for the development, which will identify all areas because the initial surveys are, are, are almost um, being selective about its core testing and where they're carrying out core testing to use examples of whether there's an issue on the site. Um, once the full survey is done, uh, the survey will be completed and submitted to Scottish Government. Um, and, and again, this is only my opinion, opinion, but that, I believe, allows Scottish Government to review 
25 pilot developments and get an understanding and, and be able to consider the level of remedial works that is likely to be required. And do you have any sense right now of when do you think that the um, the, pro- the process will or could be rolled out? Are we talking this year? Are we talking next year? And what should owners and f- um, anyone associated supporting owners factors, et cetera, do in the meantime? Um, for me, for homeowners, I would find a way into this process as soon as possible. Um, I know it's difficult um, if you have a factor in place. I know uh, I can openly say that not all member firms and not all factors uh, are following the same process. The reason for that, um, in all fairness to those that haven't and those that have, is that it doesn't form part of the factors remit in this situation because... um, we don't have control of it. We are not the owners of the property. We're not the owners of the common areas. The homeowners collectively are. Um, we as an organisation and m- many other member firms recognise the challenges there, recognise it needs uh, someone in the middle to liaise and pull it together. If, a ho- if homeowners collectively don't have a factor in place, then I would certainly advise it, um, not because it's a... a, a, a a, a business decision is just we are the people who understand the industry and, and can help. Um, if they are self-insuring, then you know, hap- happily, if anyone wants to get in touch with me or yourself, so I'll, I'll you know, quite happily give them advice on, on how best to approach it. And uh, is there anything else, just wrapping up, is there anything else um, that um, owners can do, factors can do in the interim? There is a development that we managed to um, where there was a remedial works identified to a power wall system, not a clad system. The cladding system was perfectly fine. Power wall system didn't have cavity barriers in place. And we put together some costs via diff- via project manager and went out to tender for different suppliers. Um, and the costs came back within the ballpark for the owners to be able to just pay for it, mm-hmm. get the works carried out. Where that goes forward, the only concerns that I have, and again, this is a very much a, a single opinion rather than a membership or organisation opinion, but I am aware that Westminster are talking about a cladding tax on home builders. Mm. Um, and if they go down that route, I would imagine the unintended consequence of that would be that the developers say, well, we've already funded to these developments or we're already about to fund to these developments why should we do it twice if we're going to have to pay a, a, a levy tax on, on cladding? Uh, that isn't in place yet, but that is a very real threat for the future. Um, so the sooner you get to the developers and the home builders, the sooner you get the survey done and submitted to Scottish Government, then the better place you'll be in once once the pilot has been carried out and there's a, a better understanding of process and procedure and flow. In our final interview of the evening, we'll be speaking to Chris Ashurst about the High Rise Action Group, how he founded it, and what solutions he and other owners have proposed. I wonder if you could first talk about the, the founding of the High Rise Action Group, uh, talk about how, how it came about to be. Yeah, um, I am delighted to live in a wonderful development here in Western Harbour in Edinburgh, uh, our development comprises some 279 flats, so it's quite sizable. Um, and our owners began to run into some difficulties over buying and selling, uh, kind of at the back end, really, of uh, 2019, thereabouts, um, because, of course, of the whole implications of the Grenfell fire and so on, and that the bank, the bankers, lenders had really taken fright to a large extent as to what it was they were lending on. So from that, I began to get in touch with uh, politicians, wrote to the housing minister. Um, I was invited within, (laughs) so we formed uh, um, a high rise Scotland action group in uh, with some help from people south of the border where the law is different, but there's a similar, much bigger organization there. Um, and they said, you've got to get something together if you're going to make, um, you know, make an impact at government and at different levels. So we formed High Rise, we, a big eye at that stage, formed High Rise Scotland Action Group. 
And within seven days, I was invited to give, no, uh, to give evidence at Holyrood, which, again, was a bit of a shock. Um, and I did. And from that has developed what we have now, which is people across Scotland feeding information in. And I have to say, been very well received by politicians across the, the spectrum of politics. Um, and we got in touch with the housing minister. There was already in place um, an advisory group, which included all sorts of people and they had said in their publicity and so on that this was for the benefit of the owners and uh, so I actually wrote to the housing minister and said this is great there's just one glaring hole in this you've got bankers involved in it you've got insurers involved in it you've got builders involved in it you've got lawyers involved in it you've got chartered surveyors involved in it you've got and they're all very good but the people who you are seeking to benefit aren't. And if it's in to be in the interest of the owners, don't you actually think that there should be an owner's voice into this? We have managed to form a really good relationship across all these um, disciplines. And although we come at it from different angles and with different needs and so on, it has worked really well and it resulted in the single building assessment which we've um, which we put out and some of those ideas came came from from this development here where do things stand as far as sort of the the recommendation so that 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 sing that working group that you were part of um put forward a number of recommendations i believe the scottish government took all on board uh, one yeah what one, one of them was this the the single building assessment um yeah. so if you could talk just briefly about that but also some of the other things that came out of that uh, working group that may be even less publicized, but also you think will have an impact? Yeah, I mean, I think the report which went out was actually pretty comprehensive. Um, so what is in the report was just about covered everything. Things like fire breaks weren't in place. Um, so we're not now just talking about materials. Was it ACM or was it this? We're now beginning to look at a, a wider uh, view. What what are we talking about when we're talking about safety? And the banks are beginning to get, and the lenders begin to get fussed about what is actually in these buildings. Have they been put together properly? So it's slightly developed beyond that because actually some of those same criteria impact on lending decisions. It's not just what's in the wall covering. Has the building got the fire breaks in? Have they been put in properly? Uh, you know, and so it, it widened out. And so the single building assessment was um, a device to, in a sense, give assurance above and beyond what was uh, envisaged by the Charter Surveyors and the banks in the EWS1 system. Now that the, the, the single assessment is certificates, it's, there's now a pilot project going on. Yeah which should be reaching a conclusion, I assume, soon. Um, where is, uh, so it's moved on from the, from the uh, ministerial working group to a, yeah. a new, uh, which I believe is the Single Building Assessment Project Board. Now, what is, yeah. can you talk to me what, a little bit about that? Okay, so some of the same people are involved in, uh, in that. Um, so I, I'm on, on that board, but it's been widened out because as I said earlier, um, it became obvious that it was slightly stretching beyond mortgages and and so on it, into we are really talking about fire safety here in people's lives so uh, it's got slightly amalgamated so that it's now including um people from institute of fire engineers other government uh, specialists um so we've widened that group out i say we it has been widened out by the government to include those specialities. Um, and so you're right, you, you referred to the pilot scheme and hopefully something would be soon. So the time scales are limited by resource. They're not so much limited by money because the Scottish government are paying using the, um, the uh, money that's come from Westminster. They're using that to pay for this these assessments 
for that the resource of money isn't the question, but the resource of availability of contractors, availability of people who are actually qualified to do it. One of the fears under the old system, the EWS1 system, was that there were people signing certificates who really um, probably shouldn't have been. So the banks and insurers became very, very wary about, well, who is it who's signing this bit of paper? Can we really rely on that? So we've had to broaden it out to include other disciplines. And the number of people who are eligible to do this, um, the list that is currently around for Scotland or, or is around that we can draw on, had a list of about 11 people. I mean, actually, basically for the UK, there is a there's a lack of resource in insurance. Um, we have insurance companies participating in this process. They're on the board. Um, they are very wary. They're wary about giving insurance on a building. This building I, I'm sitting in now has um, A2 certificates, which mean that you can buy and sell them essentially happily but the insurance company don't see it that way and won't give us insurance so we have a building here 100 million pound building and we cannot get block insurance full stop now but insurers see they don't talk about high rise buildings they talk about high risk buildings and actually that isn't dependent on whether it's 18 meters 11 meters it's dependent on a whole raft of other things so it's high risk to them in terms of insuring the individual buildings, but it's also high risk to them in insuring the professional um, surveyors and others to undertake that work. So there's a bit of a standoff um, at the moment. And so if, if you can't get people, we've got someone we know could do it and the government are convinced could do it, but if they can't get the insurance, um, to use a technical phrase, we're stuffed. So, and has any of the the RICS guidance that came in, you, you mentioned sort of the difference between high rise and high risk and some of the guidance that came out, it was back in March, talked about, um, it, was, it was a lot about sort of who needs an EWS form based on the, the height of the building. Is that what you're sort of talking about when you're talking about the differences between the high risk versus high rise sort of situation that, yeah, that, that mean, guidance hasn't really... Has it, has it made a difference that that, that guidance that RICS has put out? Uh, I haven't seen any evidence really of it making a, re of a okay. difference. There was the famous announcement at Westminster, uh, I think before the summer recess, that you didn't need EWS fund forms if you were below a certain level. And I can't remember whether it was the Prime Minister or another minister made that announcement. Uh, but he, that, that announcement was made without reference to the banks. Talking about, well, what's the law? Have I got to have an EWS1 certificate? No. The EWS1 mm. certificates don't come into law in any way, shape or form. It's a private arrangement put up by the banks and the insurer and the RICS essentially to try and find a way out. And, you know, hats off to them for trying to solve a problem. Is there anything other than just waiting for the single assessment that <laughs> owners that are, are trying to sell or mortgage that are stuck right now can do, or are they pretty much just waiting? They just have to wait it out. I, I think you, you, you can't really elevate your property up the list, but you can make sure it is going to be considered. So anyone can register, could, could have registered, um, a property for the initial assessment. What can individual owners do? One, they must keep up the pressure on their MSPs and MPs. You've got to keep writing, really. <laughs> you know, the fact that you've written once and that was last year, okay, well, that was last year, but you need to say, how's it, you need to go back again and say, how's it going? What's happened? Have you done it? Have there been any more debates? Have you been able to speak? Have you, what have you done? I think all owners in all flats should appraise themselves of what the situation is on their development at this point in time. If it isn't on the list to be looked at in some way, of, or they've got to come up with a plan um, and, and decide how they're going to do it. So,
Hello everybody, that's us now back live with a QA. and a um, and uh, I see Chris has managed to get back in to join us and I think hopefully David will get there soon too. Um, we do have some questions come in in the Q&A um, and once David gets to us I'll, I'll get going on those. There is still plenty of time to add more questions so please just go ahead with them. Um, the first one I'm going to pick up on is one from Susan and I, I think David and I can probably answer this one quite adequately between us but it's a question about whether you need a, a majority of owners to agree to a survey of their property. David do you want to kick up uh, kick off on this and I'll pick up on some of the other issues around the edge? Sure uh, absolutely and Annie thank you for that. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the majority, it's, it's, it's driven by the development deed of conditions. The deed of conditions um, will be uh, aligned alongside your title deed for your property, where it will give a very clear process for following, um, uh, arranging a meeting of homeowners, identifying what the quorum is to be able to achieve that majority. Um, and that can be done via the, the process. That, each deed will be very different, but it will certainly give you an indication of that process in there. Yeah, um, if people's deeds don't say anything about this, then we do have something on the website. Um, it's generally the situation that surveys count as maintenance. Um, and maintenance requires majority decision of owners. It doesn't require everybody to agree. So if you can get a majority, you can just go ahead with that. Um, and I think even when it comes to replacing the cladding, I think the ruling or the opinion from a very uh, excellent property expert um, in law who, uh, who advises us is that um, even when you come to replace cladding, replacement also counts as maintenance and should only need a majority of owners to agree. But as David points out, you do need to check what your deed of condition says about this. Chris, have you come across anyone in your group who's found it difficult to get that kind of agreement? Um, no, not particularly. I'm mainly dealing with people who are actually on the list. Um, not all of them, but I, have, I think this is a really good point, and David made the point well. People need to look and see what is in their deeds. And I have had people this week um, in a property here in Edinburgh where uh, I knew there were problems, other owners knew their problems. And suddenly, uh, about 10 days ago, this guy suddenly realized there was a problem. He'd never heard of EWS. He'd never heard of cladding. And we had this discussion. And he's in a building where uh, there has been some sort of work done, but he had no knowledge of it. So I pressed him on what was his status, not because I didn't like him. I was trying to find out what the procedure might be. And I said, you know, what's in your deed of condition? Deed of condition? You know, that actually as owners, um, we are looking to government and we're looking to advisors to help us. But as owners, and, and if people are listening tonight, hey, we need to take some responsibility ourselves and really find out what the score is in their own buildings. So if you have someone who's living in a building and has been for many years and they didn't even know there was a deed of condition, they didn't know there was anything there and they had no idea about whether the residence association was a residence association, what, what its status was. And they're in the middle of this mess. So and they're trying to deal with a factor who um, maybe slightly more reticent in getting involved than others uh, and so it's really difficult and no one had told him what was going on so to all owners you have to say come on guys we need to really um, you know shake the cobwebs off and get stuck in ourselves and make sure that our neighbours and our co-owners know what the score is that's the uh, that's the way ahead. Chris, what action have some owners groups taken to try and contact uh, all of the, all of the other residents in, in the building? What's been successful for people? Yeah, I mean, I think that has been difficult. Um, it, it, it possibly is um, a factor of having high rise Scotland action group. But the people who get in touch with you are the people who are in a pickle. 
uh, and so you you kind of hear more, more bad news than you do good. Um, but some of them have had very real difficulty uh, and try even trying to find out who, who their fellow owners are. Um, they, they've spoken to uh, a, a particular factor there. I don't think it's a kind of one of the bigger factors or national factors probably, but you know they were very reticent. And you know there's things like GPDR about giving out information about other people and all this sort of stuff. So there's a real struggle amongst owners to try and bring cohesive and joint action. Um, in, in our own blocks here, we have um, 11 stairs. We have a stair rep in each stair so that actually that person can could actually go and knock on the doors and, and try and find out who's there. That's all well and good until you come across the ones that have been let out or the, you know, they're on short term lets or whatever it is. And then you hit a bit of a brick wall. But we there are ways of trying to get information and we need to cooperate with anyone who will push us in that direct help us in that direction. So, yeah, there, there have been difficulties, uh, but people have on the whole worked through it. David, you mentioned that there was a block of, of 400 people that you had been trying very hard to get to um, take up the single building assessment. What was happening there or what wasn't happening? Yeah, that's that's probably closer to the point. And uh, what we found ourselves was uh, in a situation calling a meeting of of the homeowners collectively. Uh, unfortunately, the, the quorum was 80 plus properties which was near impossible to achieve when you have a quite a heavily weighted um, absentee landlord situation uh, within within that development and um, so in each occasion the attempts to reach the required quorum to seek agreement um, for the homeowners to, 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 to get a survey carried out uh, just hit a brick wall uh, to be fair we went down a different avenue uh, in an attempt to to uh, especially in, in this particular development because of the risk involved uh, for the insurer. And we, we approached the insurer and went down other avenues uh, and finally got part funded this, the surveys um, and, and managed to uh, fund the rest from, from, from other avenues. So uh, we got there eventually to, and we got the survey carried out, but uh, there's another two or three other developments of the same numbers that it just hasn't been achievable and, and they remain without any form of survey at, at this time. Mm. But the single building assessment, uh, once owners get in on that, that's free, isn't it? Yes, it is. And, uh, and I did note one of the questions that will come up um, soon. Uh, the, the, the whole idea is that uh, once you register, uh, the, I mean, the initial pilot was you know, certainly as an organisation, we were registering developments that didn't have a survey carried out, and there was a, a standard response at this stage because in the pilot, the pilot seemed to focus in on developments that had already had some form of survey carried out. Um, my understanding from Scottish government is that that will, uh, in further stages, will open up to uh, developments that haven't got a survey carried out. Um, how long that is, you heard Steve Garman speak um it's as, it's as long as it takes for the pilot phase to, to get all the diligence that's required for scottish government before they move to the next stage mm. uh, i'm just looking at the chat actually and um, mike has popped in that there's been a recent decision from the information commissioner about what uh, information factors can release are you able to say anything more about that david it's a very difficult one when it comes to you know data data that we hold and where we sit um under data protection and some owners see that as a an attempt to put barriers in the way um but i haven't seen what, what you're referring to annie so uh, again it'd be wrong of me to comment at this stage but i'll be keen to, to to read because it has been a challenge um not just for cladding but for numerous other things when you're managing the development um when when you know, what we do as an organisation is that if the owners approach us, we will write out to all the homeowners on their behalf to, 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 to try and seek engagement for any particular challenging issue, whether it's a health and safety issue, cladding issue or other. 
um, but releasing the data, yeah, I would, I would, at this stage, I would take the Fifth Amendment until I read that, that information. <laughs> yeah, um, cer certainly I know that Edinburgh Council um, has got um, uh, some consent from the Information Commissioner to release names of owners from the council tax register where there are uh, uh, repair developments ongoing. So if you live in Edinburgh, um, the Edinburgh Shared Repair Service are the people to contact for help there. Um, there is also quite a lot of information on the Under One Roof website. And we, we did cover this topic in a previous webinar that we did in the previous series of webinars in this series funded by St. Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust. So I think that there could be something there that will help you. Um, we do tell you how to search the registers of Scotland to find out from the title deeds who owns properties. And uh, we also tell you how to search the register of landlords. However, not everybody who's a landlord is registered uh, on, on that particular register. So it, it may still be tricky. Um, Susan's just come back with a supplementary. She's saying, is there nothing that can be done to enforce owners who are ignoring these issues, especially when there's safety involved? David, do you want to start off on this one? Yeah, uh, yeah I would have to agree with the comment, but unfortunately, um, as I touched on <laughs> earlier on in the interview, um, the, the challenge you have is that there is no legislation that exists for residential um, developments. Uh, so the point that was made earlier on uh, in regard to um, getting a survey carried out, uh, we, we need to consult the owners. Um, the Property Factors Act is a, a, perhaps an unintended consequence of the Property Factors Act, um, but, but certainly we have to consult homeowners for any non-core service works or any improvement works. Um, there has been questions surrounding whether it falls into health and safety or other. Um, there still remains a question that this almost falls into the bracket of construction uh, and design. And, and that actually doesn't form part of the, the, the factors uh, remit. Um, probably the biggest barrier is, you know, when, when we spoke about certainly one of the, the points that was made by the member firms, Property Managers Association, <laughs> was that we were, we were needing to try and find out whether there was any legislation that could be put in place. To, to, to almost make fire safety audits mandatory because they're not. They are, um, they, they, you know, they, it requires the duty holders who are the collective homeowners to get together to agree that. Um, so, so, so there's some real, real challenges in the way surrounding freehold tenure in Scotland. Um, yeah. Chris, yeah. I, I saw you jotting things down. Do you want to come in on this? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of things. I think essentially in Scotland, and I see David uh, just posted something too in the chat, but essentially the position in Scotland that there is the right on every uh, homeowner to repair, but it doesn't make it an obligation to repair, basically, unless there's threat to life and limb. That's a, a little bit of a a glib way of putting it so um you know the uh, david's referred to the uh building scotland act 2003 but it really is a tough nut to crack um so i think that's the point i think th there's another question if i can just pick up on i think mm -hmm. from um david where he has he's asked um about the responsibility for the content of the SBA. He's asked about liability insurance was very difficult for surveyors. And that remains a big issue that whilst there are people who, uh, whether they're surveyors, fire engineers or whatever, would quite like to do the work and are willing apparently to do the work, uh, that they cannot do it unless they have the appropriate level of professional indemnity insurance. And one of the things that we are trying to work out, and I don't know whether other people have got um, experience of this, is what is a profession, what is an appropriate level of um, PI insurance? So if I'm asking a contractor to get involved in 279 buildings here, 
279 flats here, insurance value about 100 million. What level of PI cover should that business be carrying in under, to undertake that work? In Scotland, under the EWS1 system, it was never envisaged when the EWS1 system was um, put together that certificates would be issued for individual flats. But because, partly because of the tenure system in Scotland, but partly too because of the issues arising on PI cover, that I, I'm going to say a device, I don't mean it was deceptive, but it was a, it was a mechanism whereby uh, individual surveyors or people undertaking that work could give some sort of assurance to the owner of one flat. And his liability, as far as I understand it, would therefore be to the owner of that flat, be to the bank lending on the back of that certificate or whatever it is. But it was limited to that particular flat therefore his level of cover didn't have to be so high if i'm now asking or anyone is asking someone to to give um, some sort of certification on a building with 279 flats or david was talking one with you know there's 400 odd people in there what level of cover and this is uh it is hugely expensive uh, and you know, I don't know what the answer is to the question, and I'm I'm trying to get guide guidelines for that. You know, some people have got cover of you know twenty five fifty thousand pi. That that surely isn't going to do the the job. Hundred thousand is that going to be sufficient? Mm -hmm. is it, should it be two hundred thousand? Should it be half a million? Should it be? Yeah, um, I'm sitting here, and you're you know people are asking the questions, and they're the questions I'm asking too. And I don't know the answer. And if anyone does, please put them on a postcard and send them to us. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I think people carrying out this work are, are likely to require millions and millions and millions of, of pounds of, of insurance cover because, you know, as you point out, you know, if it's 400 blocks, um, then, um, you know, they're going to have to cover the cost potentially of what might happen if one of those blocks became a Grenfell. You know, and if, if the loss of life was anything like it was in that horrible situation, that could just be a huge amount of money that insurers might have to pick up on. You know, I, I just I just don't really see how the traditional kind of insurance is really going to be feasible. So now, one of the um, reasons, sorry, just to say one of the reasons why I was pushing that people should be engaging with their MPs and MSPs was this very issue because insurance falls within the ambit of the Westminster government mm -hmm. and with the best will in the world the, the people in Scotland can influence and, and give their opinion and say look this is what's happening and bring reason at the end of the day that decision will have to be worked out between the insurers and uh, and the Westminster government mm -hmm. you recall that um, I guess it was about 2011 2012 there were floods across the country and insurers withdrew and basically said we're not insuring that anymore and government stepped in and put together a plan whereby they there was some sort of i want to use the word underwritten but there was some sort of deal done whereby not all of that risk fell on the insurers at the end of the day so something happened but at mm. the moment there seems to be something of an impasse. but if we don't yeah. know the size of the problem i.e. how much should we be looking for, how much should these guys be looking for, um, then, and the insurers are reticent about giving insurance and are charging premiums that are astronomical. And it, some of these firms are two, three member firms and some are smaller than that. There's no way, there's no way they're going to have the uh, wherewithal to pay that sort of premium up front. Just, just coming in off the back of that point, Chris, um, and, and David's David's point about the SBA, um, that 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 very concern about the liability insurance uh, is 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 there and and live for for factoring companies as well because people think that you know we we don't have the insurances to be involved in any surveying practice. So ultimately, I approached Scottish government at the time and said, look, you know, we we are not surveyors with facilities managers. Are you willing to? A pay for project managers to manage this and where can we find the information of the project managers that hold the liability insurance available for this. 
So they are in the process and have distributed some information on the um, fire safety engineers or surveyors that are available to assist not only the factors but the homeowners in that process. Um, and we are certainly uh, using or working from that list for some of the buildings that we uh, are submitting the applic application for in the pilot. Mm. I think I, 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 people on that list don't know what their PI cover is or aren't divulging it and uh, some are very uncertain about what the levels are. Perhaps one for a meeting tomorrow. <laughs> uh, have it in my mind. Right, okay, good. Um, we've got time for some quick responses to a couple of questions. Now, Jim Bernard here has been asking about um, can building control enforce any compliance on things? And David has come back saying, what about using uh, the Building Scotland Act 2003? David, do you have any experience of, of this power being used? We don't, uh, but I'm aware of it. Um, it was certainly one of the things um, that a colleague of mine uh, put forward uh, to myself to take back to Scottish Government when we were trying to seek some form of legislation. Um, and it's a very valid point that David's made. Uh, that, that does exist. Um, it didn't appear to be a, a, an approach that could be taken in this circumstance or was willing to be taken. Um, Certainly, there was other things we looked at via um, Scotland Act 2005, which is very specific to um, fire operatives ingress and egress uh, safely in a building. And we thought there was some work that could be done round about that. But at this stage, as Chris will be aware, there seemed to be a reluctance from Scottish Government to, to apply any form of legislation mm -hmm. um, for, for, for reasons that there could be unintended consequences that may impact other areas and, and cause other problems. Um, however, uh, for, for, for certainly, uh, in my own opinion, it's certainly the way to go forward. And there's other work, as you're well aware, um, Annie, through the uh, Tenement Working Group the Scottish Government, um, which, again, one of the suggestions that's been put forward is building audits of man being mandatory, which would bring in fire safety audits as well for, for, for buildings across Scotland. And, and certainly, from as I said, my own opinion, that is the way forward. Mm. I mean, in terms of tenement legislation, which might apply to this, um, one of the things that Under One Roof was pointing out, and certainly something that came up with the Scottish Parliamentary Working Group, is that there is a duty to maintain uh, but that only covers support and shelter, it doesn't include safety. Right. Um, and so that effectively means that any enforcement of safety is going to have to be put through local authorities. And, and really, they just don't have the funding to do this. Um, so, you know, we are coming back to government investment in local authorities and local authorities' ability to deal with dangerous buildings. Right, we've got two minutes. Um, we had a question come in um, from somebody asking about what forms of cladding are safe to use. Um, now, I, I suspect this owner may be in a more traditional building. Um, I think, you know, one of the issues we've got with this thing about cladding, uh, and you can just see it in this whole situation where it all just kind of spun out like topsy. You know, we started off finding out that the cladding was dangerous. Then we started finding out that it was the ways of fixing it that was dangerous. These are all very new materials and they don't have the test of time to them. So it's really hard for anybody to say what is going to be standing, you know, in, in years to come as being a really suitable material. Traditional materials we do know about. And, you know, some architects will stick to the traditional because it is tried and tested. Um, but I would also say to that owner who put in that question that um, cladding has also been put on buildings to increase energy efficiency. And um, it may be possible for you to get support, financial support, to, to increase the energy efficiency of your building. And I would suggest that you look at our web pages, um, look at some of the Doors Open Day seminars that we've been doing recently, um, and contact the Home Energy Scotland. Um, advice line to see if they're available to help you and if there's anything they can do in the way of grants and etc. They do provide help to landlords. 
So we're just coming up to seven o'clock now, and we ought to be finishing here. Um, I think there's a couple of things coming up in the chat here, um, but if you don't mind, because we're near the end of the time here, I think what we'll do is we'll close the webinar just now, but um, we will take, uh, you do feel free to contact us with any further questions. And um, we do publish a newsletter on a monthly basis. We will be keeping up to date with this issue. So go onto our website and in the right hand column of most pages, there's somewhere you can sign up to the newsletter. If you'd like to get in touch, be kept in touch, I should say, please use that mechanism so that we can keep you informed of what's going on. So I would just like to close with a really big thank you to, to Chris, um, not just for being here tonight, but for all of his selflessness in trying to help other owners to get things done. I, I, I just wish we had more community activists like you around, Chris. And David, I would just like to thank you again for putting yourself on the line on behalf of Factors. I mean, we really do appreciate that you're willing to come along and answer these questions because so often people will turn around and blame the factor when they're just the ones in the middle who are trying to get things done. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for listening in, for putting in your questions, and we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Thanks, everybody, and good night. <laughs>